Hey, welcome everybody. Um, I just want to make sure the audio is working okay and um, people are familiar with the platform. So if you can go ahead and uh, type in the comments um, if it's working, how it's working. I see there's a few questions coming in, so I appreciate that. Good audio, thanks, Michael. All right, well, welcome everybody. Um, this is this is going to be interesting. Um, this is the first time I've used YouTube Live, and so far I've figured out that there's a little bit of latency um, between when I'm talking and when it's actually going out. So um, there'll be a little bit of a pause, a delay, um, as if I ask clarifying questions um, about your questions till I get a response back. So be prepared for that um, pause here. Um, I have Bill in the room who's going to help me with um, doing questions as they come in. Um, Bill has been on previous live feeds if you've um, watched any of those from a few years ago now. And um, I'm going to miss having a two-way interaction. I guess we, we picked the wrong platform for that. But this is kind of a last-minute thing, and we appreciate um, you all coming to, to be here with us. So there was a question in the chat box about um, the AEX wedge. So again, clarifying question. Um, we have a 14 on one side and a blank on the other side of this. So if I switch cameras here, there's the blank side and then the 14 side. And I, I guess I wasn't prepared for um, being able to show this question, and I don't have any of the wedge pieces with me. But the wedges are, are different for the RV14 than they are for uh, the, the rest, or rest of them, or the 14 elevator than they are for the rest of them. So it's a different angle on there, first of all. Um, and then, um, let's see, the other question was something about keeping it centered. Um, is that correct? The counter sinks appear to be deeper on one side than the other. Any tips on how to make it more accurate? Um, so you mean on one side of the wedge than the other side of the wedge, I assume? Um, so that would be, that would again be the angle that would be doing that. Um, so if you can if you, um, comment on that, I guess, and let me know if that is answering your question or not, um, especially the, four, the 14 side, if you um, notice the difference there. There's a follow-up question, too. Uh, also in regards to the same device, there isn't a hole or a way for the countersink cutter male pilot to stay centered. Any tips on that or maybe improvement? OK, so it, the, the way it's designed is to be clamped down to a table in the drill press, and then you slide your wedge across here. Um, if you're using it with a hand, um, a handheld um, countersink, then you should already have holes in it, um, which would center it. So again, I, I guess I need a little bit more information to find out exactly what's going on there. So the, the countersink cutter here, for those that aren't familiar with this, has a pilot. And so it would go in the hole that's already in the wedge. Uh, if you're using it to to drill the wedge, um, then then you would want to clamp it to the drill press table. Not nesting deep enough into the device. Yeah, the the wedge should be proud of the jig, so um, so that it's it's a it's top surface is above um, the surface of the jig. So then your countersink cutter face would then be on top of the wedge face. So I guess beyond that, I'll have to uh, get a wedge and, and play with it and see if I can figure that out anymore. Maybe, maybe some pictures would help if you could send those by email. Um, and we can put an email address in the in the uh, chat box there. Uh, yes, it is. What's that? Said it, it is setting up proud.
again, the long, long delay. Any more questions while we're waiting for that feedback? Yeah. Um, there's a question from Michael here saying his uh, Clico pliers keep hanging up with the Clicos. Can the gap be closed with a vise? The gap is just a uh, small bit too large. You don't want to close that with a vise because they're cast and they'll just snap. Um, if that is machined incorrectly, uh, then they should be replaced. Um, we have had uh, a batch of those, like a thousand pliers, that were um, oversized. So um, depends on how old they are. That was a couple years ago, and um, they were some bad ones. So um, we would want to get those replaced if they're ours. Um, they are loose, they're intended to be loose, um, but if they jam in there, then they're too big. So that would be a, a flaw in the tool. Okay, next question. Uh, this comes from Jonathan. Jonathan asks, I know you're not a, a fan of the swivel flush rivet set with the rubber ring, but didn't Avery used to sand down the rubber ring a bit so the tool would work better? Any opinion given that solution? Yeah, it that does that does work better. Um, Bill, could you grab one of those out of one of the drawers in the toolbox right down below you? Um, I like I, I, I do better with visual aids. Um, so so with that, what what the deal is? If if you haven't seen my video on that, is the the flush set is surrounded by a rubber guard, and that rubber guard to get it to not move around is quite quite a bit um, protrudes quite a bit more than the set itself. And so the problem with that is when you're going to set a rivet, you have to press to get the set down against the material. And when you're doing that, um, it, um, you're pushing too hard on the material. You shouldn't have to push on the material at all. Just hold the gun up against it to keep it from moving. So you can see kind of in this shot here, the, um, there's not quite an eighth of an inch, but pretty close. So if you take a razor blade, I'll just use a piece of aluminum here and you kind of trim that down. Um, I, don't, I don't know that I would sand it per se, but trim it down um, so, that, so that there's less pushing that has to occur to uh, get the set up against the material. So that is a way to improve it. Um, the, another problem with the set though is that it's a very flat set because you can't see where you are on the rivet. Um, when you cover that up, you can't see exactly where you are. And so they make that very flat rather than truly mushroomed. So you're hitting in a larger area on the aluminum than you would with a true mushroom set. So if, you're, if you have to rivet by yourself, um, then yes, this is, a, this is a tool that takes a couple degrees of freedom. Switch cameras here. A couple degrees of freedom out of the rivet set so that it stays um, uh, fairly straight but doesn't have to be perfectly straight. And then you can um, focus your attention on the bucking bar uh, if you're doing it by yourself because you can't focus on both sides at the same time. So if you have to do it by yourself, that's a way to do it. Um, I encourage everybody for the very small percentage of um, time that you are using a rivet gun and bucking bar in the whole building process, just find a buddy and, and get used to riveting with each other. And then you can use the normal flat set with your thumb and index finger on the side and um, shoot it with the other hand and your bucker can hold the bucking bar. So yeah, I'm not a, not a fan, but people like them um, when they're working by themselves. Uh, while we're waiting for more questions to come in, I, I know there are a few topics that always seem to come up, um, especially for new builders. Uh, first and foremost being the edge roller. Mm -hmm. Way to set tension. Sure. This and, sure. Uh, how that all works. Um, let me switch cameras again here, and I can show. Maybe repeat the question just in case. Oh yeah. Um, can you guys give me some feedback in the chat if you can hear Bill okay, or if I need to repeat the question? So I'll do that right now. But what he was saying is, a lot of people um, when they come up at Oshkosh ask about the edge former. What is it? How it works? And how to set it? So I'm kind of using the light in the room here as a little uh, reflection. And you can see that this edge has already been um, seamed with the edge former. So as I hold this up, hopefully it'll focus on that. 
you can see that it's just barely um, done. You can't really see the crease, but you can see by using the reflection that the plane is broken. And what that does, for those that aren't familiar with the tool at all, is when you rivet one skin to another, um, like this, when you put the rivets in, there'll be a little bit of a gap here in between the rivets. And by breaking that edge, it makes a nice tight seam all the way along. So back to the question, the way to set it, um, is what we want to do here is we want to put it so that it's on the rollers, but not up on the part that bends it. And when you do that, you can use the adjustment at the end and just set it so that it's just snug. And then use the lock nut so that it doesn't move. And then give it a try, and it should roll nice and easy. Very, I don't know how to demonstrate tension. I'll just use a couple fingers and maybe you can see that. And then you can see that it's made that bend, but it's, it's really slight. And then come back to the end and push off the end to finish it up. Now keep in mind that I'm doing the non-hold side, and I'll bring that up to the camera again. And you can see that it's just a very, very slight bend, but it's not a crease. What a lot of people want to do is make it too tight. So I'll loosen the jam nut here. I'll tighten it up about a quarter of a turn. And then they have to really pull it to get it to work. And when you do that, it makes more of a trying to find the right there we go so you can kind of see there where it's almost crushing it right at the top side of the seam so that's not what you want you, you want it like it is on the whole side so that it just leaves the plane of the surface and then it'll make a nice tight seam what happens if you over tighten or over break that edge well there's no undoing it, <laughs> it <laughs> If you've, if you've built anything with aluminum yet, you know that once you do it, it's done. Um, so, um, yeah, I can see the comment that says about making it too tight at first. So, yeah, once it's, once it's overdone, it's done. And the best thing to do then, really, is to do the entire piece that way. So, aesthetically, it looks the same all the way down. But that's why it's important to take a piece and practice on it before you start it. Another thing people will do if they get it too tight is um, they're pulling so hard on it that you can roll up on top of this, and that just ruins the piece. So that's not something that you want to do. So very, very light tension, just so it barely rolls along. And then one last follow-up here. Which sections of which airplanes benefit from the edge former? So anytime you have a sheet that overlaps another sheet is where you want to use that. So um, where the top skin comes around and rivets down to uh, fuselage skins, where you have um, forward skins on wings that come and rivet over the top of an aft skin um, anywhere that one overlaps the other. Another question we get quite often is can you go around corners with it? It doesn't do corners very well and it doesn't do thick material very well. So um, O32 is about the thickest that you can do with it. And um, if you're really careful, you might be able to do lightning holes, but that would be dicey. Um, but a long sweeping curve, it would do that. Excellent. Uh, moving on to a question from Brian here uh, about drill bits. Occasionally numbered bits other than the standard 30 or 40 are needed. Can you recommend a quality brand of bits? Explain the difference in material they use and the types of bit ends. Yes. So <laughs> where to start with that? Chicago Latrobe are good drill bits. Um, there's some other brands. That's the one that pops out to me. Um, you can get good bits from almost any machine tool supply company. Um, most larger cities, I'd say over 50,000 people, should have some kind of a machine shop supply place close by, or maybe even a welding shop supply. Um, the the angle of the ends are 135 degree, where a normal drill bit, like if you go to Sears, is, I should know this, is it 118 degree? Something like that. It's different anyway. Um, the 135 degree are, are flatter. And then um, split point is the type of angles at the end. Um, excuse me just a second, and I'll grab a drill bit. I think I can show that.
It's a great question. So a normal drill bit is what they call an S-type drill bit. And let's try this view. Okay, so this is a normal drill bit with the, the S-type. So it's just a standard grind, single angle on the end there. There it finally goes. And then if you look at the end, it, there's a flat spot. And that's, again, hardware store drills, most of them are like this. And so when you go to use that, it will walk around on that flat spot on the end. With the split point bit, okay, we'll be patient for the camera. There we go. Um, hopefully in the quality of the stream it shows this, but there's actually two facets cut on the end there, if I can hold still long enough. Um, two facets cut on the end of there, and what that does is it makes it come to an absolute point. And so when you're starting, this, this is a large bit obviously, but it shows it well. Um, so when you're starting it doesn't walk around because of that point. And so 135 degree split point um, drill bits are the ones that you want to look for. And um, we sell cobalt bits. They last about twice as long as a standard high speed steel bit and aren't very much, um, aren't very much cost, they don't cost very much different. Blah. Okay. Must be the end of the day. Yeah. Haven't done this for a while. Um, my funny answer is until you drop the drill. Um, they, in, in aluminum, they last a very long time. You could, you could, you know, drill hundreds, maybe a thousand holes with a single drill bit uh, in aluminum. Once they touch steel, that hole, uh, that changes everything because of the hardness. And once you touch stainless steel, you pretty much ruin the drill bit. So. Um, it, it really depends on what you're drilling. And if you're enlarging holes, um, like we have here in these, these little demo strips, um, where they're matched holes, which most of the modern um, kits have the match hole pre-punch and you're just enlarging them, you really want to use a reamer rather than a drill bit. If you're using a drill bit, um, you're just on these outside edges um, of, the, of the drill here right here. And again, it's just kind of like the, the flat on the end of the standard point. It's, um, it's, it's trying to choose which of those edges to cut on. And so it's doing a lot of chattering and that makes the drill duller faster. So if you're just enlarging the hole from that number 43 pre-punch to a number 40, um, they get dull faster than if you used a reamer, which is really the correct tool to Enlarge a hole and keep it round. Hmm. Maybe? There we go. So you can see on the end of this reamer how it has a, a 45 degree angle and that centers it in the existing hole and then just takes a little bit of material out to enlarge the hole. So if, if you use a reamer, a reamer will last through the whole project where a drill bit, you'll use several of them enlarging holes. Great. Uh, next question. This is a good one. Uh, what is the best <laughs> way to set up a countersink cage? I really botched mine on the Vans practice kit, set it way too deep. Yep, so you always want to set it too uh, shallow first um, and then work your way up to the right depth. Uh, as far as the right way to set it up, it's just, it is trial and error um, until you get it the first time. And it will change with every countersink cutter. So if you use your countersink cutter in fiberglass and have to replace it, you'll have to go through this again. Um, but you, um, you, you want to pull, pull the collar back on it. I think Bill's getting one ready here. Um, you want to pull the collar back on the tool or on the cage 
and then you can see kind of how much uh, bevel's sticking out. And then you adjust it until it's way less than you think it should be. And uh, just give it a try and, and um, sneak up on it from there. If you know, um, if you're a good gauge of how thick things are, like this is 25 thousandths aluminum, um, each of the notches on the countersinks is a thousandth of an inch. So you can kind of guess if you have an idea um, how deep it is and, and you just guess and check. And again, scrap pieces from the hardware store work just as well as anything else. So, um, you know, try, try it and um, do it in the scrap piece rather than the spar or something like that. So the short advice there is find a test yep. scrap piece of material. I'll, always test on scrap, yep. And Yeah, either a rivet or um, the dimple, depending on what you're doing. So if you're if you're if you're countersinking to accept a dimple, that's going to be about um, I think it's eleven seven thousandths, eleven thousandths, something like that, deeper than the rivet. Um, and I do have another video on on YouTube that shows that. So you can you can actually mark your countersink um, with a mark on one side and then a blank piece of tape on the other side. Then once you get it set, you can mark it and then you can change it so that it accepts a uh, dimple instead of rivet. And once you get it set again, mark it again. And then you can just go back and forth between those two settings. Um, so you might want to play with that and see if that makes it easier for you because that's, that's a frustration for a lot of builders is switching that back and forth. Um, we, we've even had some customers that get multiple countersinks so they can just have them set up and never have to touch it. But that's the extreme. Uh, next up, we have a question kind of going back to the edge former. Uh, the rollers on my seam tool vice grips don't roll well. Can I use graphite on the wheels to make them roll better? You can't. This is edge former, right? Uh, the seam tool vice grips, so I assume that's the Pro Probably, yes. Yeah. Um, so these are elastic stop nuts. I'm sure you're familiar with that. and we set these so that it should roll pretty good with very little end play. So when you see that moving, it's actually um, this joint here that's moving. I'll try and hold that still. Um, but there shouldn't be hardly any end play in these. Um, it could be that these got too tight. Um, and the elastic does change over time a little bit. So that could have got too tight. You might want to give that just a fraction of a turn uh, looser to see if that helps. If that's not it, sure, you can use grease, graphite, uh, whatever you want on those. Even take it apart and um, you know, polish the, the uh, shoulder bolts on there a little bit. So uh, that's certainly not a, not a critical fit in there other than we want them to you know, roll as true as possible. Uh, next question is, do you chuck a reamer? Do you chuck a reamer? I don't understand the question, I guess. Like, do you put it in a drill chuck, perhaps? So we had this reamer. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm just looking at a comment that came in. So, so yes, you would put the reamer into the chuck of a drill um, to use it. You could, you could actually put it in, you know, anything that's turning. I've, <laughs> I, I've actually put them in a cordless screwdriver before um, with an adapter and done them that way because they don't, you don't uh, have to turn them very fast to make them work. Yep. So yes, normally people would put it in a drill. All right. Um, next question we've got here uh, looks like fly your dream. Uh, bought a, the three-piece aluminum deeper okay. kit and wondering uh, how he tells which one is for plastics and fiber versus the one for metal. Sure, let me grab that. Okay. Whoop. Tripping over my microphone. 
How now? Back up. Okay. All right. So as you're looking at this tool, you can see on this side, um, you can see that uh, the angle on this side and the angle on this side are much different. I hope that that's showing up. Um, so this is the tool that's for harder materials. Um, the, the, uh, the aluminum that we use is, is a harder material. Soft aluminum, you would want the other blade. Uh, steel would be the harder material. So all the angle is on, let's see, from your perspective, I believe it's on the right side. Um, where there's hardly any angle on the side where my finger is now. On this other blade, and I'll try and keep them both in frame for reference. This other blade, it's about half and half. So the angle on the left and the angle on the right are similar. So this is for the softer material. Uh, this one is for the harder material. Good question and they store in the handle. Sometimes people don't realize that. This one is a very old tool. It's kind of sticky. We got a good one here. Uh, Jonathan asks, any tool or recommendation on how to rivet the last trailing rivet on control surfaces where the nose yoke does not fit? That is tough. Um, a pop rivet is really, I think, what the plans say to use. <laughs> um, so the only thing that I can tell you short of, you know, grinding your thin nose yoke even thinner um, would be to use what's called the indirect riveting method. And I am going to just kludge something together here because I just don't have the right stuff to even begin to show that. But... Okay, so let me see if I can figure this out. Let's look at it mostly straight down. So if you have a back rivet plate that you can hold up to the skin side, and then imagine this piece of skin is another flat strap of steel. So if you can put that in over the top of the tail of the rivet, and then use your mushroom set to hit, now I'm going to try and change perspective again, so that, so, ah. so this is, this is my flat piece of stock um, steel, and it's hovering over the tail of the rivet, then you can use your mushroom set and you can drive right there, and that will transmit that force over to the tail of the rivet and set the rivet that way. Um, much easier to use the pop rivet, and nobody wants to do it, but that's, <laughs> that, that's the way it should be done. So. But the indirect riveting method is a trick that you might want to try, just so you can say you did it. What else we got? Seems like maybe that's the end of the questions so far. Okay. While you're doing that, um, I'll just, I had put down a couple notes that people a lot of times ask when they come up to the booth at the show. Um, one is the minimum number of tools they need to get started. So if they just want to build the tail, what do they need? Um, and it's everything, unfortunately. But the, by the time you're done with just the vertical stabilizer, you will have used over 80% of the tools. Um, by the time you're done with the, the horizontal you'll, you'll, and vertical, you'll use all of them. So um, literally, you know, if you're an aggressive builder in the first week, you will have gone through every process, um, every tool that, that you'll use in the plane. Uh, with the exception of, you know, the, there's a double offset rivet set um, that you need for wing ribs and, you know, a couple drill bits here and there, a couple counter sinks. Um, but it's, you know, nickel and dime stuff compared to the rest of the tools. So you really need all the tools at the beginning. Um, one thing you can, if you're not sure you're going to build a quick build or a regular build, um, 
unless it's a 10 or 14, there's some caveats. And if you go to our website, you can choose those things and um, that'll solve it for you. But if you're building a quick build 7 or a 9, for instance, 8, um, you can reduce the Clecos in half because um, you just don't need that many Clecos. The wings are done. A fuselage is, is done to the point that you don't need hundreds and hundreds of Clecos. So you can reduce that in half if you're building a quick build. If you're building a quick build 10 or 14, you still need them because uh, you use the bulk of the Clecos in the tail cone, and that's part of the empennage uh, kit. So, and there's, there's no difference in the 10 or the 14. Um, you wouldn't need them right away, but you know, you're gonna save maybe $100 or something like that, and then buy them a few weeks later. So that's a pretty common question that we get. Um, another one that I had written down it was kind of on a similar vein about building the practice kit. I just was just flopping around a, a example of, of parts from the practice kit. Um, either the airfoil or the toolbox um, takes a pretty good subset of tools to build it because you're doing all the same operations um, in those practice kits as you're gonna build the, in the rest of the airplane. So you don't quite need everything there, but you need a lot of them. So um, if you're, if you're you know, to that point, I guess it's time to buy tools so that you can do it right and get a feel for them and um, you know, make your mistakes on the, that practice kit. Anything else come in? We do not, nope. Um, and we've been referring most of the accessories questions to Flyboy accessories. They do a great job with that kind of stuff. I don't know specifically if they have that or not, but um, aircraft spruce, Flyboy accessories would be questions there. Um, RB Jim D, I'm not sure if that's uh, Jim Delbo or not. But, <laughs> Could uh, be. If it is. He could teach the class. Yep. He could teach the class and teach you how to fly. Yep. And he'd be all set. No one stop shop. And regardless of which gym, hello, Jim. Yeah. Hey, Jim. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, looks like it's it right now. Okay. Um, the I think I'm going to build an RV. What kind of tools do I need question? Uh, you can go to our website for that, clevelandtool.com. And Bill has designed a great page there um, that it lists out all of the tools individually, prices, quantities um, that you need to do each of the different kits. Um, so you choose which model you're building and it gives you the list of tools. Um, you can tweak quantities. Um, if you already have some stuff, you can put zeros in for that. And then when you get it all done, you can swipe it over to the shopping cart. Um, but it, that's, a, that's a great way to see what you need and, and see what the things are. You can drill down from that page into the individual tools if you need to know what they are, um, if you're not familiar with them. So that's a great place to go for that. Um, there's always questions about which RV. Um, and you know, you can you can direct those to vans because everybody has their own preferences and their own missions for those. Um, what if I mess up a part? Parts are cheap is what I always tell people. Um, you're going to mess up parts and so just get going on it and, and have fun with it and you'll learn along the way. It's the, the kits are designed to, to start with the simpler tasks first and, and work your way up. So um, start with a practice kit um, is, is a great way to get the feel of the tools if you're if you're not um, familiar with that, if you're not familiar with um, working with aluminum, that's a good way to start as well. But yeah, dive right in there. Don't, don't be one of the guys that has a kit in the shop and won't start it. Yes, Bill? Uh, why, as a question from Kenneth, uh, why are there different lengths of di and diameters of flat squeezer sets? Good question. So the flats, or the squeezers, uh, the adjustable squeezers, sets are only so adjustable, right? So when you're rotating them, you're unthreading them. You're, you're disengaging the threads that are in the adjustable set. And so if you're doing really short rivets, uh, you should use um, longer sets. Uh, and if you're using longer rivets, then you can't get enough adjustment on them and then you have to use shorter sets. So that's the reason for that. Um, 
the, uh, the occasionally you'll get to places that something is in the way and you have to use a longer set. Um, but in general, that's the reason that we have them different. We've got a few more questions in here. Um, one related to supply chain, uh, which we kind of know is unpredictable at this point. Do you expect the tool shortage and time frame to get better? I wish I could predict that kind of thing. Um, and I don't know. Um, we're seeing it everywhere from steel um, to shipping delays. Um, so I'm not sure what it is, if it's a worker shortage, um, which I know that shippers are seeing. Um, they've been advertising locally for people to deliver packages in their cars from UPS. So um, <laughs> it's, it's a crazy time right now. Um, we're, we're seeing stuff that we've never had a problem getting um, back ordered for months. Um, so I really don't know. We're, we're seeing it in the raw materials for the stuff that we produce in house. And we're seeing it in finished products we're getting from other people. Um, we've heard from our vendors that they're having a problem with labor. We've heard from our vendors they're having problems with material. So I, I just really don't know. And I don't know how long it'll last. Hopefully not too long. Um, but we don't know. Um, was there one more? I'm sorry. There's a few more, yeah. Yep. Uh, Jonathan, can you apply too much uh, for dimbling with this? Mm -hmm. Or is that not really possible? So the squeezer for, for dimpling, I'm sorry, for dimpling with a squeezer, right? Um, dimpling, you cannot apply too much, unless you're breaking the squeezer, I guess. Um, <laughs> I cannot apply too much. Um, so it takes, the a pneumatic squeezer um, produces 3,000 pounds of force, 3,000 pounds of force. Um, and it takes every bit of that to get a good dimple. In fact, you can get a better dimple with the C-frame than you can with a squeezer because of engaging the spring back angles of the dies. Uh, so, so really, no. Um, with a hand squeezer or pneumatic squeezer, you're not going to crush the material. Um, and in fact, I recommend that when you, when you set the squeezer, that um, you, you uh, extend the, with, it, with it compressed, you extend the ram until they touch, and then uh, decompress it and then give it another half turn, three quarters of a turn maybe, and then squeeze it again. You should see the yoke flex um, with no material in it. And if it's doing that, you're as tight as you can get it and um, it's set right for doing dimpling. Um, for riveting, obviously, then you know you can overset the rivet. So. Uh, while we're on the topic of squeezing... Oh, I'm sorry. I have one more thing to add. Um, in dimpling with the C-frame, you can hit it too hard. So the impact tool, you're putting a lot of force um, in an immediate um, action. And you can start to see the material crushing around the outside of the dimple. So if you're, um, you know, when you're, when you're doing that and inspecting your work, make sure you look at that and make sure you're not crushing it right at the outside of the dimple. Because it doesn't take as much as you think. So you should hear should hit it at least twice, and you should hear a little ping on the second um, hit. So we have some YouTube videos on that as well. It helps a little bit if you use Scotch-Brite and scuff up the shiny surface, um, only for testing. I mean, it doesn't hurt the airplane. You're going to scuff it up to paint it. But um, if you scuff up the piece and then dimple it, you'll really see a bright ring if you're hitting it too hard. So play around with it, hit it too soft, hit it too hard, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, while we're talking about squeezers, are you able to demonstrate Again, I don't have those trailing edge wedges, so I can't really demonstrate. Um, I do have a video on my phone of um, Keith Campbell at WNC Aircraft um, did this while we were, um, I guess, I don't know what you call it, refining the design of the sets. And I recorded that, um, so I will put that up. Um, on our YouTube channel, and I will link in this video so that you know where to find it without having to hunt around. I think that's the best way to do that. So what he's asking about is um, these sets here where um, it sets, sets the rivet in the trailing edge wedge that's shaped similar to that. So they're, they're not parallel like most of the rivets in the airplane. They, they're a wedge shape. So 
it's it's a I can't remember what they're called two-sided countersink double flush so yep we'll get that posted uh, is it becoming more It is. Um, it used to be very important that you had a really good drill, um, a, a fast drill, and uh, one that that had really nice bearings because you wanted to be able to drill that hole through both sheets and have it be a very round hole. If you've done that much drilling thin um, thin material with a with a drill bit from from no hole, um, you notice that as the drill bit gets dull as the speed gets low or as your pressure gets too high, you end up with a triangular shaped hole. So it was really important that you had a fast drill. Um, nowadays with the pre-punch stuff and with the reamers, um, most people are using cordless electric drills and uh, lithium ion batteries have come along. Um, they've got lightweight, they last a long time, they're powerful. Not that you really need the powerful uh, part for this, but um, so yeah, I use a, I use a, cordless, a cordless drill um, for almost everything I do. And you don't have to listen to the air compressor run. Um, when squeezing a rivet with the pneumatic squeezer, does it matter whether the plunger contacts the head or the tail of the rivet? It does not. No, nope. you're just you're applying the force to both sides, so whatever works best for you. Usually you find that the squeezer body is on the outside of the airplane, um, just because of the way the geometry works. Yep, yep. They, um, in fact, <laughs> it's funny. People think of this as a rivet squeezer, or the main squeeze, hand squeezer, or any squeezers as rivet squeezers. But really, half the airplane is dimpled with the squeezer. All the in, the entire inside of the airplane is dimpled with the squeezer. So, um, yes, you do a lot of dimpling um, with the squeezer. And you can also rivet with these tools, but, but it's um, a lot, um, it used a lot more for dimpling than it is for riveting, because you can just get the edges with the rivet. Um, our squeezer has a adjustable set holder, um, which is a two-piece um, a two-piece set holder. So there's a male thread on the bottom and a female thread on the, part, on the top. So you can, you can rotate this and you can adjust it up and down. You see it coming out of the, the squeezer there, and so you can change that to get the uh, different tension, and like I was talking about earlier with the dies, and adjust it for um, different rivets. And um, our our main or our uh, pneumatic squeezer is the only pneumatic squeezer that comes with that stock. So if you're looking at other squeezers and see the price difference, there's a um, a big price difference in that adjustable set. Um, you ask specifically about the um, the main squeeze, which is this tool, and again it has that same adjustable set so that you can um, adjust it for the length of rivet or tighten it up for the, doing the dimpling. You're welcome. Anything else? Yeah, um, next, uh, next question, this is more of a general, general question, but for, for those who might not know, why are you so into RVs? <laughs> um, yeah, so my, my dad built an RV4, uh, started I think in 84 and finished it in 89. Took a year off in there to move houses, so had a little break in between. And um, he just wasn't happy with the tools that he found. And he built steam engines and clocks in his garage, had a little machine shop and was kind of into that thing. So he made a lot of his own tools. And um, in 1989 at Oshkosh, he won the grand champion up there with his RV4. And um, people started asking him, how did you do this? How did you do that? I built a tool, can you make me one? And um, at the time I was in college for um, computer programming and uh, he bought a CNC lathe and said, can you help me program this? And we fought for a couple years. Well, I learned how to do machining and he learned how to do programming. And we came up with dimple dies and sold that for um, a year. And then people still kept asking, well, where do I get a better one of these? Where do I get a better one of these? And so we just 
worked into the whole whole kits from there. Nice. Um, we have somebody who's asking a question. If I have the pneumatics, do I need a handheld riveter for the RV10? The pneumatics. Oh, okay, I see the way it's spelled there. Um, so either way, either with the pneumatics, spelled N-U-M-A-T-X, or the pneumatic, P-N, um, either way you do not need a handheld squeezer. Um, I'm trying to think if there's a caveat because of the foot pedal on the pneumatics. I don't, I don't think so. So we built the whole RV4 with the, the pneumatic squeezer. We never had a hand squeezer. There may have been a, a rivet or two that we, you know you could have done if you had a hand squeezer, but um, definitely wouldn't buy one for that reason. Um, the reason the hand squeezer is handy is uh, if you don't want to fire up an air compressor to do one or two dimples or one or two rivets, um, or once you take the airplane out to the airport again, if you you know you don't have a compressor or something, but uh, really you don't need both. Um, there's there's not places that you can't get in um, that are that are very many places like that anyway. Um, next question about uh, back riveting. Uh, Rick asks for back riveting using the Avery C frame. I need the thick bottom plate and the 12 inch back rivet rod, correct? That is correct, yes. So we do sell that as a, as a kit. Um, The, uh, let's see, yeah, you can see that here. Um, we have these pieces and the bottom plate as a kit. Um, you'll have to probably, I don't think that's on our website. I think you'll probably have to call to get that. Um, the only difference is with Avery's tool, it does not have this larger hole in the base. Um, ours accepts the 401 shank where his is a 3 16 pilot. So you'll have to use a unibit um, to drill that out to three quarters of an inch, which isn't a big deal if you have one, which you should for airplane building. Um, yeah, and then um, then the rest of the parts that you need come with that. And then yes, you're right, you need the long uh, back rivet set to go in the top to put the rivet gun on and set those rivets. Uh, Rick followed up. I think you said to back rivet the web to spar caps for C frame. I'm not sure if that's connecting with anything. You said to back rivet the web to spar caps. Rick, do you have a follow up to clarify? Yeah, I'm not understanding that. Sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, I am. So, one of the first things you do in the horizontal stabilizer, riveting this, the uh, uh, doublers on, is that? Is that what you're thinking there? Yeah, it's very handy for that if that's what you're talking about. Um, so you can use some blocks and kind of block up the spar and then go along with the C-frame and, and drive those longer eighth inch rivets, uh, which is a more controlled way to do it than to try and do it with the rivet gun and bucking bar or um, the squeezer will do most of those, I think, too. But it's, it keeps them straighter if you're, if you're in the jig like that. It's keeping them 90 degrees. What's, uh, what's your best advice on uh, the leading edge of the rudder uh, for that, making that bend, uh, especially on like the RV9, where you're, you're having to, to roll that without... It's, uh, it's hard. Um, d just do it like the instructions say. You know, use a pipe, use duct tape. Um, you have, to, you have to bend it more than you really want to, and sometimes you have to massage it back just a little bit, but that, that's a hard thing, and, and it's, it's uh, hidden, you know, once you're done. So what you do want to do is, is um, try and keep it so there's not resting tension on it. Um, you don't, you don't want to make it so that you're having to pull it down to Clico it. Try and get it bent so that it's pretty close, so that you're not um, building tension into the piece. And does the amount of mass in the pipe make a difference? The pipe or the uh, broom handle or whatever? <laughs> I don't, 
I don't know that it does. You you wouldn't want to use a piece of PVC or anything, but um, yeah, something very rigid because you're putting a, quite a bit of torque on it. Jonathan has another question about uh, a preference for using the C-frame on concrete. Uh, is it worth the effort in terms of end results to use it on the floor? So if you're riveting with it, it, it does make a huge difference because you're, you're super solid on the floor and all of your force is going into, into setting that rivet. Um, the, uh, when you're doing dimpling with it, you want to have it over like a leg on the table or something that's that's very well supported. Um, most of the time when we get calls for people that aren't making a good dimple and we talk about what the, their setup looks like, they have the C-frame the in the middle of a table just like this, you know, because you want stuff on both sides of it. And the table's doing this every time you hit it. And it's, it's absorbing a lot of that force, which you need that force to make the good dimple. And so, you know, throw an extra leg under it if you're going to do that or something to make it really solid. Um, if you're riveting, yeah, put it on the floor. That's, that's the best way to do it um, if you can't support it really, really well. Um, is it worth the effort? I don't know. You're crawling around on the concrete floor. <laughs> so um, I, I always stress that if, if there's a comfortable way to do it, do it that way because you do better work if you're comfortable. Um, but yeah, you just, just try it and see what works for you. Uh, can you talk about the difference between the two different types of Clico type fasteners that you sell? I can. Um, so <laughs> that's a huge supply chain problem. Um, we do have some of the wedge lock fasteners, which for decades has been a better tool. Um, we're like on a nine month waiting list right now for those and it's just it's just undoable for most for most people um so the wedge lock fasteners are smoother if you can get a hold of them um they the the three prongs that come out um come out straighter and and tend to stay in line better than the other tools do and then the part that grabs the back side of the aluminum are a little bit sharper so that um, they catch a little bit better. Um, as far as just all around the quality control on the wedge lock are better. Um, the quick lock is, is the next best and that's what we can get. And so that's pretty much what we're selling now. Um, you know, if, if you want to build, that's what you're going to use. Um, so they're, they're pretty good. They, they're just not quite the quality control that, that we like in the wedge lock. Again, that's what we got. So. Uh, really important question here from Fly Your Dream. Do you have a toolkit ready for the RV-15? What's that? I've never heard of the RV-15. <laughs> uh, Can you tell me about what the RV-15 is? Well, this is this is a fun Oshkosh-ish conversation. So. <laughs> uh, I don't think you'll see one at Oshkosh. <laughs> uh, Brother Eight Fifty Four asks. We haven't talked about that yet. Um, you know, traditionally we've done a special just on the kit. Um, I, I guess I don't know, so I guess stay tuned for that. Um, and then Steve asks on the flaps and the ailerons. I have tried the 3M tape. It does not seem to seal the edge of the skin as well. Can you talk about techniques for using the tape? on the flaps and the ailerons. Seal the edge of the skin. I'm not following that. Steve, are you talking about back rivet tape? Steve, seal the edge of the skin. Oh, are you talking about in between the wedge and the skin? Is it on the trailing edge, in between the wedge and the skin? We'll see if that's what he's talking about. I'm guessing that that's true. And I guess if it is, if that's where he's talking about um, between the edge and the, and the skin, or sorry, the wedge and the skin, um, I've never done it that way. I've clicked it up with the uh, Pro Seal, um, let it cure, and then put the rivets in that way. 
So is that Joe that's asking that question? Uh, Steve was asking that. Oh, okay. Um, we have about five minutes left if anybody wants to ask any additional questions. Um, Oh, Jensi is uh, holding up the choose the DRDT or the C-frame tool sign. So that must be her question, Is is um, which people ask a lot, which one do I want to do? I see the reamers and drill bits coming up too. So um, C-frame versus DRDT is really um, how noisy you want it to be. Um, we talked about how you can rivet with the C-frame. You can't rivet with the DRDT. You can't set rivets with it. You can just dimple with it. Um, so both tools for dimpling, um, the DRDT is silent and um, it's repeatable every single time. It works like the squeezer does where it's a compression force. Um, so you want to set it as tight as you can and that's, that's why it's as beefy as it is if um, nobody knows what I'm talking about. Um, new people don't know what I'm talking about. We'll see if I can break my back here. Ah. This this is the DRDT, <laughs> and so um, it uses a toggle link mechanism on the end to apply that pressure. And when you have it set right, you'll actually see it spread um, about three sixteenths of an inch or so to get the right pressure on there. <laughs> so, see if I can do it again. Ah, so you can see that putting it on and off the table is not really what you want to do um, versus the C-frame, which you can pick up with one hand. Um, I generally leave this in the table. You build a little table top around it um, to have the, the skin um, propped up on and keep it parallel or perpendicular. And you can pick it up with one hand and set that and the table up against the wall. Um, but that's the difference. It, the C-frame is the noisiest tool in the shop. If uh, It beats the rivet gun even when you're hitting it with a hammer. So if noise is a concern, then the DRDT is your tool. Talk a little bit about this, but reamers or drill bits. So, we, I guess I'll go off the assumption, unless you want to ask, yeah, put clarifying answer in there. Um, if you're, uh, we talked about it a little earlier. I was going to say. So, if you're doing pre-punched holes um, and you're just enlarging that hole, the reamer is the right tool to do that. Uh, it makes a nice uh, round hole uh, versus the drill bit that skates around the side um, and you'll have more of a burr with a drill bit than you will a reamer, so. Um, will you consider supplying toolkits for the sling aircrafts? This is mostly pop rivets and 120 degree dimples. Sure, if you have a list, send it to us and we'll um, take a look at it and match it up to the tools um, that we have. And uh, so a, a lot of the tools, um, you can get locally for some of those things too. So like a hand pop rivet puller, we've quit selling. Um, you can get them locally and we can't get a really good one. Um, so we don't sell those. There's a few things like that. Um, but yeah, with you'll need Clecos and I assume countersinks and some dimples. So yep, we can take a look at that list and um, send, you a, um, send you a kit basically. So. Um, and then this know, was a follow-up to the reamer or drill bit. Do you have a preference for reamer versus drill bit in the pre-punch kit? Absolutely reamer. No, no question about it. It's, it's the right tool to use. Um, they last longer. Uh, you'll, you'll get through the whole kit with one reamer versus you know, half a dozen drill bits at least um, for enlarging the holes. There's less deburring to do. Um, yeah, over and over again, the reamer is the best, best tool for that. Steve was following up uh, on the 3M tape question. Mm -hmm. um, sounds like, yes, he was referring to the, the trailing edge. Um, he's used Pro Seal in the past, but has, is trying tape on this, this build. Yeah, um, I haven't tried the tape, so I guess I, haven't, I don't have an answer for that. But thanks for asking. Great. Looks like we're right at time here. So Excellent. Uh, well, I don't know how many people that joined us, but I appreciate it. I appreciate uh, getting the chance to pretend like we're at Oshkosh a little bit. I'm going to miss everybody. I'm going to miss um, meeting people and talking to people about airplanes and hearing stories and stuff. So I'm 
I'm glad that you guys joined us, and um, we'll do it again soon. Thanks.